Everybody who is trying to get a cup of coffee, you're missing good stuff over here. Come in. <laughs> Good morning, it's uh, so great uh, to be uh, back together again. <laughs> after, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 after a long COVID break, I am uh, really happy to see everybody who uh, made it over here to sunny, hot Austin, and everybody who is joining us uh, online. Uh, it is uh, our usual theater time. It's time to uh, meet, uh, see old friends, time to make new friends, time to collaborate, time to share, time to advance CEDA mission. Welcome to CEDA 2022. <laughs> we had a great start yesterday. Uh, we have outstanding student volunteers, student, our student representative. I wanted to introduce uh, our uh, student reps, uh, Megan LeMay and Zishon Cho. They, uh, they organized a wonderful student day yesterday. And uh, please uh, share a few words and introduce students. Uh, our student representatives will introduce students. When they introduce, please uh, stand up and we'll uh, leave clapping for everybody after, after the end of introduction, okay? So we can move on with our agenda. Uh, please. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you to those who attended Student Day yesterday. We had 18 presentations ranging from back to the basics talks, um, hands-on tutorials and scientific communication. Now we will call out the student universities that are in attendance. So students, if you can please stand when you hear your university call. Arizona State University. Boston University. Case Western Reserve University. Clemson University. Coastal Carolina University. Cornell University. Dartmouth College. Department of Space Science and Engineering, National Central University. Amber Radio Aeronautical University. <laughs> Florida Institute of Technology. Georgia Institute of Technology. Hampton University. Illinois Institute of Technology. Indian Institute of Geomagnetism. Magnetism, <laughs> India. <laughs> Los Alamos National Laboratory. NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. National Central University, Taiwan. National Institute for Space Research. New Jersey Institute of Technology. Pennsylvania State University. Um, Peruvian University of Applied Sciences, Santiago de Circo, Lima, Peru. Rice University. The Space Weather Monitoring Center, Helwan University. All right. Stanford University. Um, University of Texas at Dallas. <laughs> University of California, Berkeley. Um, University of Bergen, Norway.
University of did you do Illinois? Illinois? At oh, that was the first one. Never mind. <laughs> um, Universidad de Ingeniería y Tecnológica, UTEC. Um, Universidad Nacional del Cal Calau. Uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, University of Bath. University of Calgary. Um, University of Colorado Boulder. All right, I definitely didn't do um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. <laughs> uh, University of New Hampshire. University of Scranton. University of Texas at Arlington. And our very last one, Virginia Tech. Thank you, everyone. University of Michigan. <laughs> Any other ones? All right, well, thank you, everyone. have a great start of the meeting with introduction of our uh, prize lecture speaker. Our prize lecture winner this year is Dr. Larry Lyons from UCLA. And this uh, prize lecture is uh, given not only for outstanding contributions to ionosphere, understanding of ionosphere magnetosphere coupling, which has been the theme of Dr. Lyons' work, but in particular for his recent work on in understanding and advancing and understanding of connections between uh, auroral streamers and traveling ionospheric disturbances and understanding impacts of aurora. Please welcome Dr. Larry Lyons. Julius, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to be the first speaker at a live conference, at least for me, in two and a half years. So it's kind of a strange position. I don't think I've ever gone anywhere near this long without giving a live, a live lecture. And of course, I would also like to uh, thank the people that have, researchers that have worked with me along the way on this, on this topic that I've listed, at least many of them, probably forgot a few. <laughs> Uh, on this general topic, starting with uh, Dave Evans, who was the first to introduce me to studying the aurora, and then to this list of you know, very talented young researchers and students and postdocs that I've had the you know, real privilege to, to work with as part of my group at UCLA, you know, a very talented group. So what I'll do is I'll start with some very basic background as to why reading the aurora allows us to identify flow channels and how this reading shows structured flows being an extremely important part of our whole system for the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere, starting from the day side across the polar cap and into the night side and how it leads to night side uh, oval flow channels which become a <laughs> critical element in um, a magnetic activity and connections to the ionosphere and thermosphere and briefly mention some aspects for the future. So let's start with the, the basic background. You know, back, back when I started, I learned, you know, when I was a graduate student, that the ionosphere was infinitely conducting. High densities, right, high densities, um, few collisions, so the field lines are infinitely conducting. Those electrons can move up and down as fast as you want. So the only way you can get field line currents is what you need for aurora is to have something funny happen. 
And so everybody was studying anomalous resistivity at that time. But if you didn't study anomalous resistivity, you didn't get funded for studying the aurora. <laughs> I can promise that. Um, OK, but now let's look and see. Uh, Let's think about that a little different way. You're going to have currents from the magnetosphere to the ionosphere. The particles that are carrying those currents have to go from the magnetosphere to the ionosphere, right? And so uh, to get downward field line currents, that's electrons moving up. So you can calculate the maximum current you can get out of the ionosphere for electrons uh, going up. Whoops, didn't mean to go fast forward that. Um, and that's, you know, a big number, 10. I'll get the uh, pointer button down. That's 10 to 100 microamps per square meter. But when you talk about upward field line currents, that's the only way you can do that is to get ions to move from the, from the ionosphere to the magnetosphere, right? And if you calculate that, that's less than one microamp, significantly less than one microamp per square meter. And the rural field line currents are like one to 30 microamps per meter. So this concept of infinitely conducting just doesn't work for upward field line currents. So you gotta go into a different direction. So the only other particles we have, if it's not from the ionosphere, are the magnetospheric particles. And if you look at an isotropic distribution of electrons in the plasma sheet and calculate the full loss cone, isotrop isotropy, how much current can that give you? Well, it's about one microamp per square meter, which isn't enough. So the only thing you can do to get more field line current is to create a uh, field line potential drop, which in it just enhances the parallel velocity of the particles and moves more particles into the loss cone so you can get an enhanced field line current. Okay, so this really wasn't considered uh, significantly at the time. But there was this very obscure paper that nobody ever heard of by uh, Knight that he wrote for his, PH, for his master's thesis, um, working with, with Jim Dungey, and he simply calculated the field line current as a function of the field line potential drop from just shoving more particles into the loss cone. And he said, hey, wait a minute. You get the right field line currents that we see for the aurora for field line potential drops that look like the peak of the energy spectrum in the precipitating electrons. And so that was completely ignored. But then somebody, I forget who it was, pointed that out to me. I read that paper. So well, let's think about that. OK, so if we, if this now became known as the Knight relationship that it relates the field line current to the field line potential drop. So if we look and simplify things as much as we can and say particles are coming down the field line, gaining energy that's greater than their initial thermal energy, and we're not shoving all the particles into the loss cone, so we get a limitation that way, then you can write this Knight relationship as very simply as the field line current is equal to a constant times the field line potential drop, where this constant depends upon the density and the thermal energy of the plasma sheet particles. Okay, so now this is derivation almost on the back of an envelope or back of a piece of scratch paper is it in reality. So let's assume that there is a, um, let's apply this Knight relationship to MI coupling in the very simplest possible way we can think of, all right? And nothing simpler than this. So let's assume that there's a discontinuity in the magnetospheric electric field. The electric field's doing this, right? And uh, at the time, we are thinking about the dusk side convection reversal. So this solid line is meant to represent the potential in the magnetosphere for simple discontinuity and mapped along field lines to the ionosphere. Xi would be distance in the ionosphere. So given that, or just a simple discontinuity, we want to calculate what the potential is in the ionosphere. OK, that's the dashed line here. So we can do that in the simplest possible approximations. Field line current is just the divergence of the height integrated Pedersen current, and we neglect longitudinal variations to make it simple. We just have variations in the north-south direction. So that's just the height integrated Pedersen conductivity times the, the gradient in the ionospheric potential. And so we know the field line current, we just say K from this Knight relationship times the field line potential drop, which is K times the ionospheric potential minus the magnetospheric potential. Okay, so let's let the height integrated Pedersen conductivity be constant. This is just a simple discontinuity with one electric field on one side, another electric field on the other side. And so these two terms can be written as a simple 
second order differential equation in the ionospheric potential as a function of that constant K, the Pedersen current and the electric field discontinuity. And that's got a simple solution. The simple solution was just that the field line potential drop equals a, a maximum at the center of the discontinuity and decays with an exponential with the width. And here's the width and here's the magnitude of the field line potential drop depending upon the uh, electric field discontinuity as you would expect. So taking some reasonable numbers, plug those in, you get a width of 50 kilometers and a field line potential drop of uh, two and a half kilovolts if I took an electric field discontinuity of 100 millivolts per meter. So that says that if you have an electric field discontinuity that's doing this, that's at least strong enough, it'll give you an auroral arc. It's going to give you a field line potential drop. The field line potential drop is just to give you the current to maintain current continuity in the ionosphere. It accelerates the electrons uh, to get more particles into the last cone. And then, of course, they gain energy, by the way. And that gives us the auroral arc, which we can see. And so with that auroral arc, we can see that there's a shear in the, in the flow. So if we apply that, now we know more about these flow channels. We know that there's these strong localized flows in the ionosphere and in the magnetosphere. And so we can rep represent that as an ionospheric potential with a steep gradient, then weaker gradients or maybe even reverse flow on the sides. And we solve for the ionospheric potential. So on the one side of this flow channel, I have the flow coming out, you'd have an upward field line current and you'd have an aurora and you'd have a downward field line current on the other side. So presumably this is long. So when you have a aurora, you have uh, a flow channel to the right of the aurora. When you, well, the, the aurora is to the right of the flow channel when looking uh, along the flow direction. So this means we can see the arcs, right? We don't have good convection measurements everywhere, but we do have good ASI measurements, at least at times when it's clear. So we can see these flow channels uh, via the aurora, which is what I've been calling reading, reading the aurora. Okay, just to show how well this works is this very well used uh, picture that uh, Bea Gallardo put together. And here we have one auroral streamer, two auroral streamers, three auroral streamers. This is the magnetic pole. This would be 70 degrees. I mean, this would be 80 degrees. This would be 60 degrees <coughs> latitude. And you see the streamer, and this is the super darn line of sight measurements. Uh, with line of sight flow, and red is towards the radar, and the deeper the red, the stronger the flow. So you see the strong, relatively localized flow channel just riding along the edge of the streamer. So this, this works. And it's also important, and has not really been considered enough in my opinion, these flow channels, you can see them coming all the way up to 80 degrees latitude. So they're entering the polar cap from the, uh, they're entering the oral oval from the polar cap, okay? Yeah, that's really important. Okay, now typically <coughs> when we thought about convection, we don't have the large convection measurements, so we've, we've, we've stuck with uh, statistical models which give us uh, uh, these simple two and four cell convection patterns that you often see and we often use. But when you look at the real auroral measurements over the uh, entire oval, and this is the best picture I've been able to find of that. Maybe somebody will show me a better picture, I'd be happy. But this is the best case that was put together by Yong Shi back uh, 10 years ago. And um, these are just line of sight measurements, day side to the night side, and you see these localized flow. Here's a flow enhancement over here, a flow enhancement over here, a structure over here, a flow coming around over here. And of course, they relate. when we have auroral measurements, you can see they're related to the aurora the aurora at the poleward boundary of the oval we call poleward boundary intensifications, and they can extend equatorward. And when they do that, we call them the auroral streamers. So this is very much not this picture that we see, okay, in the statistical models. It's very, very much more, more structured than that, and I think that's, that's fundamentally uh, important. So let's start by thinking about the structured flow from the day side to the night side to the polar cap that we can understand with, with auroral measurements with the help of the radar measurements. So let's start on the day side, okay? So on the day side, this is optical observations, and this is a, f can't quite see the numbers, a few hours of, of, of time, okay? And you see these structures, bright, discrete auroral structures moving forward out of the day side from 
this is presumably the open closed field line boundary or near the open closed field line boundary on the day side. So these structures are moving forward. There's lots of them. So these are arcs moving forward. If you got arcs moving forward, from what we talked about, there's got to be localized flow channels adjacent to them. So the convection has got to be very structured. It might look something like this, which I pulled out of a paper by Catherine McWilliams. Uh, here's super darn measurements looking along a forward looking beam. And look at all these stripes of enhanced convection going forward. So this is going forward, very, very structured. I mean, going from you know two kilometers a second to nearly zero to two kilometers a second to nearly zero. So, and these things are, are moving forward. So this is not just a simple convection. So the simple smooth convection. So the connections from along the field lines that are driving the electric field that's driving our whole system is obviously connected to the day side magnetosheath. And that connection to the day side magnetosheath is clearly highly variable. Hasn't been studied very much. There are a few studies about this thing in the magnetosheath causes this thing that they see in the ionosphere, but not in any general way. And that's driving the whole system. So we really got to dig into that much more carefully. And it's obviously associated, whoops, with, uh, with, with magnetosheath structure in the plasma and uh, the magnetic field variability. And there's a whole interesting topic that people study on that. OK, so well, let me go back again. Maybe. So as these, whoops, as these aurora forms move into the polar cap, they decay away. You don't see the, the, the aurora so brightly anymore, but you're left with these polar cap patches, which is the heated ionization, heated plasma from the, and the enhanced densities from the precipitation associated with the aurora. And so we see those as, as, polar, cap, as polar cap patches. And here is a brightening of the dayside aurora moving up into a polar cap patch. This is from a paper by Boyi Wong. And it moves up well into the polar cap, and a DMSP patch goes over that patch. So when the DMSP patch goes over that patch, well in the polar cap, there's no particles coming down. You see this in strong enhancement of the density, which means, that, yeah, we're over that patch all right. And then at the same time, you see the strong localized flow going anti sunward. You see just how much stronger. That's, you know, in this case, it's what, 500 meters per second compared to almost zero. So it's the kind of structuring we have. And this is in the polar cap, sort of on the day side half of the polar cap. Go over to the night side half of the polar cap. A similar study was done using the Superdon radar uh, by, by Yang Zhou. So these flow structures that we see initiating on the on the uh, day side are moving well into the polar cap, over the pole, into the night side polar cap. Well, they're not going to stop there. They're going to continue on down and hit the night side auroral oval. And you can see them. Here is an example of super darn observations looking forward. Here's latitude 74 to 80 degrees. And you see these bursts of enhanced flow moving equatorward, and they hit the night side boundary. This is an auroral kilogram. Auroral intensity is a function of latitude and time. And each time one of these things hits the night side boundary, you see a brightening of the aurora. That's what we call the polar boundary intensification. So pretty much a one-to-one a -one association between these flows and the, and the aurora. And here's an example with a localized flow structure here. As it hits the polar cap boundary, you get the intensification of the aurora with a PBI and, and turning into an auroral streamer. So these flow channels, starting from the day side, working their way over the polar cap, are hitting the night side uh, polar cap boundary and entering the auroral oval, so they're crossing the open field line boundary. So by definition, that's reconnection. And so it's driven, localized reconnection. And you see those flows just going right across. The first person to see that was uh, Odile de la Beaujardier in her 1994 paper. I didn't, didn't realize how important that was at the time, but I do now. <laughs> so this is really fundamental, this, this localized uh, reconnection. OK, so, so at this point, we've got these flow channels, which are starting out with their structure on the day side. That's got to be due to the structured connection to the magnetosheath. And that structure connection to the magnetosheath is moving across the polar cap. Uh, I've only seen one paper that studied that, why that happens. 
So this is like, you know, this is driving our system. Let's study it. I think it's really important. What is causing and controlling this propagation of these flow channels across the polar cap? When they hit the night side, they're clearly uh, giving us the uh, night side localized reconnection and leading to the PBIs and then more equatable into streamers. And as I'll talk about to many other things, all the major disturbances that we know about in the oral oval. And to do that, these impinging flow channels must, when they lead to the reconnection, the plasma that they create in the plasma sheet must have lower flux tube integrated entropy than the surroundings so that that bubble can move, move equatorward. So how does that happen? I haven't seen anybody ever address that. The only ideas I have is that if you're bringing highly variable convection across the open closed field line boundary, the plasma you're bringing into the plasma sheet has to be highly variable. That's a possibility. Another possibility is that it drives localized reconnection and that severs some of the plasma from those flux tubes and reduces the entropy that way. But I don't know how that happens. So it's far from, from, from adequately studied and it <coughs> leads to the, the vast majority of our space disturbances. Okay, so now I want to talk about, now they've come into the plasma sheet. So these flow channels are now in the plasma sheet. They're called bursty flows or BBFs in the plasma sheet. We call them flow channels when we see them in the ionosphere or when we see them in the polar cap too. And that's a, <coughs> an elemental feature of uh, night side activity. So this is just a, a beautiful slide that's put together by, by Sneha Yadov and she'll giving a paper on, with this and other things later on in the week. And this is just a streamer seen by the Themis ASI at uh, Fort Simpson. Beautiful streamer, it's one of those rare cases where you get a nice, isolated, well-defined streamer going from high latitudes to low latitudes. These things here are trees. And when you look at the ground magnetometer data at Fort Simpson, yeah, there's some wiggles going on, but the big drop in the ground, the thing that's causing the action that's gonna affect the ionosphere and thermosphere is the streamer, and of course that means there's a flow channel right adjacent to it, so a combination of the flow channel and the ionization due to the streamer. That's what's giving us the action in the ionosphere. It extends from high latitudes here, while at least deep in the auroral oval, down into, into, into lower latitudes. So this is what seems to be giving us the, the magnetic perturbation. You, you can see it here. Now, most people hear about substorms more than you hear about streamers. So what's a substorm and how does that relate to streamers? A substorm is something different, okay? Substorm starts, this is Themis ASIs over North America, and you get this initial brightening that you've all heard about along an east-west oriented arc near the equator boundary of the Oval, going back to Akasofa in 1964. And you see this what we call beating, which is little blips of light regularly spaced just like linear waves, and they're linear waves. Those waves, you can see them just grow. This happens over and over and over again. They grow, grow with time. They spread in azimuth. I have some little arrows that I can't quite see from here, but you can see that it's spreading uh, westward and eastward, these waves. This is just an instability in the inner plasma sheet, different from a streamer. And the waves just grow, and eventually they become nonlinear, and you start to see streamers. Okay, and that's, when the, that's just a classic instability in the inner plasma sheet, east-west oriented, the onsets within the plasma sheet, and initially there's no streamer activity. You don't get any streamers until you get this nonlinearity of, of the waves. So here's another way of looking at it. Let's take a slice across here in the east-west direction. And if we do that, so this is longitude, you see, when you get the initial brightening, you start to see this wave structure. Then with time, that wave structure expands in longitude and go eastward or westward or both. And the waves just grow, 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 grow. And then it becomes bright when it becomes nonlinear. And that's when you get the dramatic poleward expansion in the streamers. This is from a beautiful paper by, by Toshi Nishimura. Okay, so now let's relate the substorms to streamers and what happens during a substorm. When you get a substorm onset, as you see one right here with the brightening and you see the beating going on here and the nonlinear growth, then over here about seven or eight minutes later, you start to get the development of streamers. 
your streamers, your streamers. And so if you look at the ground magnetic field data, you don't see much until you maybe a little bit of dip in the magnetic field, but the big drop in the magnetic field happens when you start to see the streamers. And that's the time when you see the mid-latitude positive bays, the PI2 pulsations were the classic uh, definition of a substorm onset, including the magnetic field drop. But those signatures and the action that's occurring is all a response to when you get the streamers during the development of the substorm expansion phase. Okay, it's not the feature of the substorm onset. Not much is happening with the substorm onset. It's only when you get the streamers, okay, that give you the strong action. The streamers, of course, are the flow channels. And we're working together. <coughs> and if you look at, uh, here's an example where we have a nice substorm onset. Here's the beating, then you start to get the streamers, and here's the streamers, we get the magnetic field drop and all the other action with the PI2. Then it settles down. Nothing much is happening. There's a gap in all the magnetic field perturbations. Then the streamers start up again. No substorm onset, but the streamers start up again. And everything looks like what we used to call it, we just might have called the substorm. The magnetic field uh, drops. The, you get the mid-latitude positive bay, you get the PI2 pulsations, but that's not a substorm. It's just strong streamers start to pick up, okay? So that's what's giving us the action. So the, the action that we're seeing in the oral oval generally is due to the streamers. Substorms can lead to strong streamers as they do here and in the previous examples that I've seen, but that occurs during the expansion phase. And that same idea carries into, out into magnetic storms. We're using the aurora to identify when a substorm occurs and when it doesn't. So here's three examples I picked up of storms where the IMF is very steadily uh, southward. And you can see the development of the ring current and the supermag AL index is staying down here at quite high levels. But you only got very, very few substorms. You know, all this activity comprising a magnetic storm that's happening, all this activity, all this AL activity, it's churning along, that's what we like to, 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 to understand, all that, what's the effects of all that. But it's not due to substorms primarily. All this activity is just due to the streamers. We look at the auroral images and read that aurora, you just see the streamers coming down, the streamers coming down, the streamers coming down, and very, very few substorms. Okay? Uh, if you had a fluctuating IMF as you might have in a high speed uh, stream storm, you'll have more substorms. Why you have more substorms then? But it's still dominated by the streamers. Okay. So let's look now at streamers' impact and substorms' impact on uh, traveling ionospheric uh, disturbances. This is supposed to start automatically. That's what we are working on. There it's going. All right, good. I guess I made, maybe I clicked yeah, and, it, and it made it go. So here we have the, the TEC observations here and the auroral observations over beautiful coverage over the entire uh, North American continent. You can see the equator, the oval starting to expand the equatorward, and we get a substorm, this beautiful substorm, poleward expansion, of course, all those streamers that are causing the action. And then about a half an hour after the substorm onset, we see the large scale traveling ionospheric disturbance moving nicely down the continental US. So that was you know, well known that it was due to activity. This shows that it's due to associated with a substorm. But if the elemental cause of the activity during the substorm is a streamer, then you would guess that it's the flow channels and associated streamer that really should connect directly to that large-scale traveling ionospheric disturbance. So to look at that, we went over to Alaska, where you don't have the broad longitudinal coverage, you don't have the broad latitudinal coverage to low latitudes, but what you do have is uh, simultaneous oval coverage with imaging, from Don Hampton's Green Line Imager here, and radar flows, and uh, total electron content. So here is an auroral kiogram from 930 to, still on over here, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so you see a substorm onset here at this time, a little bit before 10, and then soon thereafter you see a group of streamers coming on down equatorward in the aurora, you see the equatorward motion of that, and then it stops for half hour or so, then or maybe less, and then picks up again. 
And when you get the streamers, that's when you get the magnetic field dips on the ground. This is the X component and the X component, X component and the X component. See, the big drops are associated with the streamers. If you look at the total electron content that, uh, from, from Shenrong's uh, plots, you see the total electron content enhance associated with the streamer. Of course, that's just the ionization due to the auroral precipitation. That comes on down, that comes on down, as it should. But this is the equator boundary of the oval, and you can see that it connects on to uh, ionization that moves further equatorward. And you do the differential TEC, you see the ionization of the streamer and directly connects to enhanced ionization that moving equatorward at a slower speed, so moving at a very different speed than that of the streamer, so you know it's something, something different. So yeah, there's the streamers, there's the ionization from the streamers and the subaural absent, and that's a direct connection to the TID. So you can see it's the streamer and associated flow channel that's giving you the direct connection to the to TID that's, that's, moving, that's moving equatorward. So, and a similar thing has been shown by, by Toshi on the, on the day side for, for the poet moving over all forms, they do the TIDs on, on the day side. Okay, it was also fun to look at the, what these things, streamers do to the winds if there's a strong, uh, strong flow shear. So, initially we have some aurora and we have the neutral winds in red from the Fabry Pro and it turns from eastward to westward as I guess is typical on the night side aurora. John says yes. <laughs> uh, he knows better than me. And here comes an auroral streamer, and when you get the auroral streamer, you get the first enhanced plasma flow westward as it approaches, and then eastward as it sinks below your, the Pfizer radar here. And you can see the enhanced flows, and you get the strong eastward flow and if you look at the neutral wind, this is again from, from Ying Zhou, um, get the neutral winds and neutral winds, are, they're fairly weak to begin with, but then as they enter this first, the region of the westward flow, they slow down a little bit, then as they get to the strong eastward flow, they jump up by uh, at least 200 meters per second, driven by the flow associated with the streamer, so the flow channel associated with the streamer. So we have also have flow channels heading into the head of surges. You've heard of the substorms. You sometimes get this westward traveling surge. And here comes a westward traveling surge here, here, and here. And if you look carefully here, you see a streamer heading right into the head of the surge. This is typical. I've seen this any time I've had the opportunity to get good enough auroral images to see what's going on. So that means you've got a flow channel going right into the head of the surge, and it looks like it's coming from the polar cap. This is work by Yuzhang Ma, uh, which he did it when he was visiting us, student when he was visiting us at UCLA. And you look at the Pfizer radar, the red is towards the radar, the blue is away from the radar, so you can see that flow channel heading right into the head of the surge. So I think that's really important on what's feeding new plasma into the plasma sheet and causing the continuation of that westward traveling surge but that's just speculation at this point. Um, but also significantly, uh, you would expect that to significantly affect the, the neutral winds, and it does. Again, from the paper by, by Ying Zhou, in this case, we have westward plasma flow and westward plasma flow, you can see it here, and westward winds, as you can see over here. And then as the Surge, let's see which surge approaches, the flow along this streamer here is pointing in towards the head of the surge, right? You can see it doing that. And, and as it does that, first this westward travel, this westward flow slows and also actually turns eastward. Dramatic change in the flow associated with the streamer that's associated with the flow channel that's feeding the westward traveling surge. And then as the surge passes by, the flow changes again and things return back to, to being westward. And you see a similar things with, um, with streamers and a connection to saps. Sometimes you see these nice beautiful flows you see in the potential maps and make, you think that saps are nice uniform things, but they're not, at least often they're not. You see the, the flow channels 
coming in, and when the flow channel gets into the equator, equator of the world over, you see strong enhancements of the SAPS flows. They can go from zero to one kilometer a second, you know, very, very quickly. And it was first seen by, by uh, Roman Makarevich when he was visiting us at UCLA back in about 2010 and 11. And these flow channels, these flow bursts in the sub-auroral region, which are driven by the flow channels all the way back to the day side, right? And they're critical for, they've got a lot of attention lately because they drive, are associated with Steve and are also beautiful observations of sub, uh, sub-auroral proton aurora associated with these things. And I'm sure much more that we haven't, we haven't studied, including what their effects are. Let's see, now if we go on to the neutral wind effects of these SAPS enhancements, here's an event. Okay, here's an auroral kiogram. Here, initially we have some, some streamers weak streamers, and you get weak saps flows. Look at all the structure in the saps flows. It's not uniform. Then when the streamers stop, the saps flows stop. And here you have the growth phase. I was always thinking that enhanced convection is what was causing the saps. But when you have the enhanced convection, the, flow, the, the saps are decreasing. I have, this is one case out of one. <laughs> that, that's all I know. And then, um, when you have the expansion phase, then you start to get the strong streamers. When you get the strong streamers, then you get the strong flows. And if you look at that, that's really highly, highly structured. And at the same time, you look at the winds. First, you have nice zonal winds. You have enhancement of winds in the saps region. Then when the, when the streamers go away over here during the growth phase, the saps, the winds decrease. Then you start getting the strong saps over here associated with the streamers during the substratum expansion phase flow channels, and you start to get the very, very strong winds in the saps region, which have really interesting effects that uh, some people have, have studied. So, and another question I have for, you know, is what is the streamer now, just looking at this, the streamer versus enhanced convection control of the saps. I was always thinking it was a haps conve enhanced convection, but it could be that the streamers and the flow channels are having at least an equal that's uh, something I think we need to, to think about. Okay, then another major disturbance is omega bands. Omega bands is the dominant disturbance we have on the Don side. They can have magnetic field depressions of several hundred, even up to seven or eight, maybe even a thousand nanosensors. So they can be big things. And again, they are driven by streamers. That was first seen by reading the Aurora in a paper by, by Mike Henderson in 2002. Here we have, this is typical of the Morning side aurora, a nice arc along the forward boundary of the visible aurora, pulsating aurora going on, the equator to that, and you start to get PBIs, some forms moving eastward. Then you start getting the PBIs, they start going further and further equatorward. Now one touches it. Look what happens to the auroral oval on the, on the dawn side. You start getting these waves propagated across directly. Look, this is just feeding that plasma into the magnetosphere and developing these beautiful waves. Here comes another streamer. Watch what this one does. Here you've got these omega bands going. This one comes down, it doesn't quite hit that feature. Watch what happens when it hits this feature. Here it comes, getting more and more equator word. The flow channel's getting there, the low entropy. That's streaming down, and this part of the aural oval just gets sucked up forward. So you've got this half going down and that half going up. This is really happening, and this is a result of these flow channels and the low entropy. So this is causing this, this tremendous activity. And let's see. So here is work by, by Zhang Liu. If you fly a, you fly a satellite, if a satellite crosses one of these omega bands on the, on the uh, morning side, which is being driven by these flow channels, right, from the, all the way from the day side across the polar cap onto the night side, now getting over onto the morning side, look at the flow as you go forward, very weak eastward flow, very weak eastward flow, then right as you hit the polar boundary of the oval, Right at the boundary between upward region two currents and downward region one currents, and boom, the flow jumps up from essentially nothing to seven or 800 kilometers per second in a very abrupt shear. So these strong flows are actually very, very common on the Don side. That's what we're calling Don side auroral polarization streams, or DAPs, because they're really analogous to the saps on the, on the, on the uh, day side. They're, they're affected by the flow channels, and they're in this low conductivity region of the downward region one currents on the Don side where there's very weak uh, electron precipitation and conductivities are low.
So there's flow channels and there's all this precipitation. So what's their effects on the, on the thermosphere? I have no idea. <laughs> OK, so that's it's sitting there waiting for us to, to figure out. OK, so we also have learned, and I think it's quite clear now, though some people in the, in the gem community will still argue with me, but that the, but not here, this is a different community. Um, <laughs> Uh, that is the flow channels coming in that are triggering the substrate onset. I think that's really, really clear now. And when the flow channels come in, the flow channels come into the inner plasma sheet. Okay, as they're getting to the inner plasma sheet, if you do the RCM modeling that uh, Che Ping Wang has done, you can see that the low energy particles go off to the Don side, the high energy particles drift off to the, uh, to the dusk side just due to magnetic drift, energy dependent magnetic drift. So that bubble that's coming in. It expands and it grows, and it becomes east-west oriented on its, in its, on its edge. And that eastward oriented edge is why the substrate onset is east-west aligned. That's what's driving that instability. You're changing the energy distribution over a, uh, a longitudinally extended region. And then it grows longitudinally. And we find that if you do the look at Ping's model, you get very, very well defined predictions of where flow enhancement should occur with this expanding, as a mutually expanding flow channel, or low entropy plasma, I should say. You get enhanced flows in the DAPS flows on the Don side, enhanced SAPS flows on the duskward side of the substorm onset. And what I didn't realize when we were looking at all that, that this is exactly the same picture that Shasha Zhou had put together back for a PhD thesis you know, more than 10 years ago before we had any idea about how these flow channels behaved and that they trigger substorm onset. So I think this well-defined picture, this would be substorm onset, and here it's expanding, uh, is, is now I think we understand that. So the flow channels, again, from the day side, are, are giving us this, uh, explain the picture of the substorm onset. So I think that reading the aurora shows that we have this structured flows from the day side to night side, which is so these very strong connections to magneto sheet structure that's propagating from the day side to the night side over the polar cap. How does this, how does this all occur? And so what's the physics of these connections and how are the flow channels carried over the polar cap? And then we see that this connection of these things to the night side via the localized reconnection, and that's driven localized reconnection. How does that lead to the low entropy plasma? And then these flow channels seem to be a major elemental feature of night side activity, uh, giving us the majority of the major magnetic field depressions, leading to the major disturbances, substorm streamers, omega bands, westward traveling surges, and, and other things. And uh, there's much to learn about how, how this all works in terms of the connections to the night side activity, the role you know, to the different disturbances, the connection to the neutrals using realistic specifications okay, of these flow channels for the different situations and the full ramifications of the uh, connections to the, uh, to the um, silver ore region. And just for fun, this is sort of the end of the talk, but these things are supposed to start. So there they go. Thank you. So this is just an under, uh, uh, unutilized resource, is the, these red line cameras, which allow you to see the arcs over the polar cap and into the auroral oval. So during the question period, um, you can look and just see how, remember, this is, the, this is the polar cap, this is the auroral oval, and just see the direct connection between these polar cap arcs and all the phenomena that's occurring in the auroral oval. And so you can just, just, just entertain yourself with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, 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 we have uh, time for maybe a couple of questions. Yes, please, uh, please, and there. Uh, yes, who is our MIG person? Uh, <laughs> yes, I actually wrote down my question, Larry. <laughs> so, Larry, could you just review the? I'm in particular interested in giving us a, some kind of time difference between the start of the streamers and the start of the substorms. But before you do that, maybe could you review the steps of a substorm onset? And that's kind of at the beginning of your talk. Oh, the, the, say the, the 
streamers to the onset? Yeah, well, just review the steps of the substorm onset. So and because I, I think you. Substorm onset. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, the substorm onset, if you look at it just in the aurora, um, first you've got to have a growth phase. So you've got to have the equator expanding oval. Okay, so let's assume that's happened. And you'll get a, a poleward boundary intensification, intensification along the auroral poleward boundary. Then from that, a streamer comes down. As that streamer gets near that region where the substorm onset wants to occur, that's when the substorm onset occurs. That tells us that a low entropy flow channel is coming down to that region. And when that happens, then that's when that occurs, then you start to see the beating, which is the evidence of a longitudinally aligned instability in the near Earth plasma sheet. And that instability you see is the auroral waves, they just grow, and uh, that causes, the, that's the substorm. Okay, so you're saying the streamers are before the big intensification? The streamers come before. Hey, there's two, okay. two kinds of streamers here. <laughs> okay. That That's the confusion. <laughs> All right. So first you see these weak little streamers connected with PBIs. They don't have any magnetic field effects. Okay. You know, they, they can be seen. I've seen a couple of papers now that have seen that. But they come down and cause a substorm onset. Then the big stuff. Okay. Okay. That, was that can happen, you know, like during a storm and during enhanced convection periods with or without substorms. But during the substorm, it happens during the substorm expansion phase and develops during the substorm expansion phase. And those are the big things. So that's where I got you confused. Well, then I have one more confusion here. Then you said at the very end of your talk, you said flow channels trigger substorm onset. Yeah, so that streamer coming down is the marker. That is, okay, okay. Marker of the flow channel that's coming down, even if it's weak and not causing big magnetic field perturbations as, as they do during the expansion phase. Thank you, Larry. We also were reminded that we have a question submitted through Slido, and we will look at a quoted question. Which plasma instabilities do you perceive interact with fast flow channels within the ionospheric EMF regions to create the overall streamers? Now remember for the flow channels, I'm just thinking that very simple material that I gave at the beginning, right? If you got a flow, that means you've got an ionospheric discontinuity, which is in the, uh, in the electric field, which is giving you the upward field line current. And that's the upward field line current, which is causing the streamer. So I don't really envision that being an ionospheric instability in any way. It's just this requirement for current continuity in the ionosphere in the presence of the converging Pedersen currents. Okay, and streamer is a type of discrete aurora. I can see that one really quick. <laughs> yeah, just one more, excuse me, wait, wait, just one more, uh, one more thing. So, uh, uh, so that you remember, uh, oh you, remember <laughs> you remember this from all of us, we, uh, mm, I, I, okay, I, I, I think this way. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Um, I didn't so, expect that. <laughs> Yes, well, thank you so much. It was a beautiful walk and a really wonderful lecture. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. We'll continue, we'll continue the session and, uh, okay, I need a little bit of help over here. Uh, um, our, uh, as you know, we are, uh, our community is searching for answers, how we can advance, advance our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, today, we invited, uh, 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 we have invited speaker who is an actual professional on these topics. Our next speaker is Tihama Lopez Bunyazi, and she's an associate professor at the Jimmy and Russell and Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Uh, uh, she is a political scientist by training, and her scholarship is broadly concerned with matters of race, racism, and anti racism in the United States. And she will be talking about uh, inequalities in public education and how it affects uh, STEM fields. And I, I, she is, uh, she is virtual speaker. She participates online. Yes, please. Good morning. Um, 
I want to make sure that I am not getting any weird feedback. So I'm hoping that that's working. Yeah, um, I'm going we, to... we, hear, we hear you. We see you. Looks, looks good. Everything's good. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I want to give a special thanks to MacArthur Jones for this invitation. Um, so I, I've been asked here to to come and talk about about some of the things that that bring um, inequality into into our lives and into our fields. Um, this is as true for uh, the many fields that are represented at your conference as it is for mine and various social sciences. So my presentation today is called Equal Opportunity, the, equal, the Legal Inequality of Public Education and its Relationships to the STEM field. So from where I'm sitting, we have more problems to solve with science than we have scientists. Um, and so with a lot at stake, US public education in particular really needs to prepare the next generation to, to address these issues and to solve as many as possible and hopefully as quickly as possible. However, we're falling short in this preparation and we're doing this unequally. So in this presentation, I'm going to ask and address Three questions. The first is, how did the US Supreme Court's decisions contribute to the situation? How are public school systems differently preparing our young people? And what can we do to ensure equal opportunities in public education? I'm gonna start with Supreme Court decisions. So this is gonna be a bit of a historical review. Some of this may be familiar, but I have a feeling you'll take away at least one new thing. Many of you are familiar with the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954. This was actually a consolidation of cases that not only came from Kansas, but was also uh, taking cases from Virginia, which is where I am currently, Delaware, South Carolina, and Washington, DC. Um, and it, it was in regards to black students being denied entrance to particular public schools. The question before the court was does does segregation of public education based solely on race violate the US Constitution? In their unanimous decision, um, the Supreme Court overturned the separate but equal doctrine that was established in 1896 in the Plessy versus Ferguson case. They went on to say that racially segregated facilities on their own were inherently unequal and violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. They also did something a little bit unusual, which is even as, as legal scholars look back, it, this is unusual, that the court said that segregation based on race establishes a sense of inferiority. So to actually get to that sense of what it means for people, okay? Now, one year later, there was a follow-up case uh, and this is where the courts were speaking directly to states and said, listen, you need to come up with your own desegregation plans and then implement them with all deliberate speed. So it wasn't enough that, that the case in 54 was said, the court is now speaking to states and said, you need to correct this. Okay, so this is a very big deal, so much so that probably everyone in the room knows this case. Now, 18 years later, there's another case that occurs in Texas that reaches the Supreme Court called San Antonio Independent Schools versus Rodriguez. Um, pictured here is the lead plaintiff, Demetrio Rodriguez. He is the father of children who are enrolled in the Edgewood schools. And in the state of Texas, funding um, for public education came from both the state and the local levels. And half of the funds um, were coming from the local levels. So what we see here is that, you know, there's, there's inequality when it comes to income and wealth, and that those things are correlated often with race and ethnicity. And in Edgewood, which was predominantly Mexican-American and low income, they were able to spend $37 per pupil in the school district. But their neighbors in Alamo Heights, which was predominantly white and upper income, we're spending $413 per pupil. Okay, so huge 
discrepancy and they're right next to each other. So the question here before the court is, does Texas's system violate the constitution by not providing equal funds to its school districts? I want you to brace yourself for what the ruling was. In a 5-4 decision, not unanimous like the previous, the court says that there is no fundamental right to education in the US Constitution. Furthermore, it said that the Texas system did not systematically discriminate against all poor people in Texas. Therefore, Rodriguez and um, his co-plaintiffs lost the case. Writing for the majority, Justice Lewis Powell said that to the extent that the Texas system of school um, financing results in unequal expenditures between children who happen to reside in different districts, we cannot say that such disparities are the result of a system that is so irrational as to be invidiously discriminatory. Now, he said, not so irrational, it could be a bit irrational. Um, discriminatory, yeah, but not invidiously so. Okay, the following year, there's another case that also rocks people's sense of what equality is and what it is we're supposed to be doing. And that came out of Michigan. This is Milliken versus Bradley. Um, in the state of Michigan, schools were not uh, legally at one point uh, racially segregated. However, the NAACP argued that Detroit as a, as a locality when their local government and the state of Michigan and its government created policies that nonetheless increased racial segregation via housing segregation. So what does that mean? As um, particularly after 54 with the Brown case, there is um, this increase of, of white flight, right? A white Americans who are moving away from city centers and into suburbs. This is definitely a post-war phenomena for many reasons. There's more opportunity for people to become homeowners, but this correlates also with desegregation plans. Now, this was such a, uh, a point of anger and, and intention um, that there's all kinds of conflict that's coming out during this time. Um, in, the, in the left, you can see a picture of these burned school buses that were set afire by the Ku Klux Klan in Pontiac, Michigan, um, just days before seg desegregation plans were to be implemented. Um, the, the thing that NAACP is charging um, the governments with is this idea that they have a hand in, in this segregation um, and that there should be some sense of accountability. The reason they're saying that they have a hand in this is because as suburbs grow, well, suburbs need water. So you gotta get pipes out there. They need sewage. They need electricity. They need amenities. They need public transportation. And so the governments are, um, they're, what they're saying is that they're enabling this growth. Um, and so the question that's before the court here is does segregation as a result of housing segregation still qualify? A segregation and therefore needs to be remediated. In a 5-4 decision, they said uh, school districts do not, um, they do not have to correct for de facto segregation unless one can prove that there's racist intent on the part of the districts. Okay, so there are some really important dissents that come out of this. So now Thurgood Marshall, who was a um, the lead counsel for the NAACP during the Brown cases. In his dissent, he writes that school district lines, however innocently drawn, will surely be perceived as fences to separate, to separate the races when under a Detroit only decree, white parents withdraw their children from the Detroit city schools and move to the suburbs in order to continue them in all white schools. In another dissent, Justice William Douglas wrote, Today's decision, given Rodriguez, right, the previous case, means that there is no violation of the Equal Protection Clause, though the schools are segregated by race and though the black schools are not only separate, but inferior. But since Michigan, by one device or another, has over the years created black school districts and white school districts, the task of equity is to provide a unitary system for the affected area, whereas here, the state washes its hands of its own creation. So. Basically, what, he, what he's saying here is that the state had a hand in creating this situation. 
not only are they these schools separate racially because of people have moved and because the government has made it possible for people to segregate but these are also unequal schools because the funding is different which was related to the previous case with Rodriguez, which is now permissible. Okay, so where does that leave us? De jure racial segregation of educational facilities is unconstitutional. So that means that by law, like it, it cannot be written in law that educational facilities be segregated. However, de facto, so like in kind of real life, right? Like just because um, a racial segregation or it still exists nonetheless outside of whether or not it's legal, these educational facilities that are segregated are still permissible unless they are intentional. That means that you have to prove intent. And that becomes an increasingly difficult thing to do. Furthermore, when it comes to the matter of wealth, the Equal Protection Clause does not require absolute equality or precisely equal advantages. Unfortunately, there is a relationship between wealth and race in this country. So, Public schools in the U.S. are largely funded by local property taxes, which means that wealthier communities have more to allocate to their schools and poor communities have less. Wealthier communities also tend to be predominantly white. Now, that does not mean, right, that there are not poor communities that are also white. That is very much the case in the United States. But when we look at who has the most financially, those districts tend to be predominantly white. In predominantly white school districts, received $23 billion more than majority schools of color. And even though they serve the same number of students, that is the statistic that was um, circulated widely by an organization called EdBuild. I'm gonna be showing you some more data from EdBuild in just a moment. Um, so better finance schools with higher proportions of white students are more likely to have teachers who are teaching in the field of their expertise, right? That means that if you are, have a bachelor's degree in um, English, you should be teaching English. If you have a bachelor's degree in math or a master's in math, you should be teaching math, right? It's not some kind of like situation that I had when I was in middle school where my, my teacher who taught pre-algebra was actually an English major, okay? Um, you're also more likely to have teachers who are more experienced, right? They've been teaching longer. They have teachers who are better paid. They have more access to counselors. And they expose their students to a richer, more challenging curricula with gifted programs, project-based science classes, higher level math and science, art, and extracurricular activities. These better finance schools with higher proportions of white students are less likely to have overcrowded classrooms, have a high number of uncredentialed teachers, have teaching vacancies, have vacancies filled by substitutes, have problems with vermin in their buildings, and report inadequate textbooks and other educational materials, including computers, which at this point is like as commonplace to many of our students as pencils. So using the EdBuild data, they created this great website, and you can look at it for yourself, um, looking at the entire United States and identifying districts that are next to each other that have really high disparities in their funding. So I'm pulling out a particular section here um, that's in Texas. The parts that I highlight in green are the wealthier districts. So how much more so? So the Franklin district is able to spend at least twice as much on their students as their neighboring districts. When you look at the racial breakdowns of these schools, the disparities are huge and obvious. So are the poverty rates, okay? I'm gonna show you one more out of California. Again, this is like twice as much. <laughs> look at, look at the, the breakdown of percent non-white. It's huge. It's almost entire. These schools at the, the bottom two rows are almost entirely non white. Okay. So, 
how does an unequal fi unequally financed public education system impact STEM readiness, right? Just thinking about even just algebra as a gatekeeper type of class, um, right? That's going to going to probably encourage students to continue on with those STEM um, courses. We see that about a quarter of um, public schools are they're, they're having their kids enroll in algebra in middle school, which is great. That's ideal. Almost 70% are starting to take algebra in ninth or 10th grade and the remaining are taking it into their junior or senior year. Okay, now if we look at those who like grade eight in their enrollment in algebra, on the far left is a, is a bar graph of all enrollment in, in grade eight. So regardless of subject matter, this is what our, our racial breakdown looks like. So 49% of the students who were in grade eight are white. You, get, you see 17% are black, 25% are Latino. These really kind of smaller ones that don't show up well, we have American Indians, 1%, 5% um, Asian, 0.4% is Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. At the bottom, 3% uh, is two or more races. So in the middle, we're seeing what is the distribution of those eighth graders who are enrolled in algebra. All of a sudden, we see the change of proportions, right? So even though 49% of the students who are enrolled in eighth grade are white, 58% of those who are enrolled in eighth grade algebra are white, right? And so we start to see that these, they're not equally distributed, right? And then we look at those who are actually passing the course, greater disparities. Okay, so, then if we look at those who are enrolled in eighth grade algebra, who is passing? So 85% of white students in eighth grade algebra are passing. 74% of Asian students are passing. That's how we read the graph, right? 72% um, of Latinos in eighth grade uh, algebra are passing. 65% of Black Americans. Look at what's going on with our indigenous communities. 30% and lower are passing. This is really concerning. The next graph I'm gonna show you should really give a lot of pause. In the blue are all high schools. These are about like what courses the schools are actually offering. So do students even have the opportunity to take these classes? In blue are all schools. In green are those that are predominantly black and or Latino. You should probably be concerned that only half of all American high schools, public schools, are offering calculus. And 38% of predominantly Black and Latino schools are offering calculus. Um, there is a 10 percentage point difference of those taking advanced mathematics. We have a nine percentage point difference in physics. And at its best, only 60% of our high schools are offering physics. So there's a lot to work on here. What can you do though? Well, you can do a great deal actually. Flex the mentoring muscles. This is something we all need to be doing. Um, in the workplace, this means that, you know, we try to build up our colleagues um, and support them. That can be as easy as taking people out to coffee and asking what they're working on encouraging them to present at places like the Sutra Workshop. Um, it could mean co-authoring. It could mean a whole bunch of things, but it means making personal connections with people and, um, and really trying to grow these STEM fields overall because we need more scientists. We don't actually need to be uh, reading people out. We need to be bringing people in and nourishing them, right? At, the, at that young level, our kids, and then getting them in to college and then you know, advancing um, into these professions that badly need um, thinkers and tinkerers um, and people who are working collaboratively. In other ways, we could be reaching out to you know, local high schools and middle schools, either in mentoring programs with them, maybe there's tutoring that could happen. 
or maybe there's something that, you know, it's a little bit less demanding, but still meaningful is bring, you know, local kids into your workplace and just expose them to what it is that you're doing. You know, let them see what it looks like. What is science? You know, how does it play out? And that there are everyday people who can participate in this. In a more structural way, this really means that we need to be advocates. Um, there are budgets on the floors of our, you know, our local municipalities, various bills, propositions, candidates. We need to be supporting those type of people and those type of ideas that are gonna bring greater clarity to the United States. Um, and as a lot of people think this is overwhelming, but the local level is so much where it's at right now. So just being interested and paying attention, um, I think that really goes a long way. And really the bottom line is here that we can't wait for someone else to do the work. Um, and so I really just want to um, commend your organization for bringing in more of these topics that, you know, I was watching the previous presentation. It was fascinating. I wish I understood more. And if I were there, I could ask more questions. But um, the fact that you are integrating these other issues is really important because it's about the lifeblood of the field. Um, and it's about whether or not we're going to be able to do the most for our planet and for our people. So I just want to thank you all. Um, I don't know if there's time to take questions, but this has been a real honor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bunyaze. Do we have questions in Slido? Okay, it seems like we have uh, some questions. Yeah. Can you, uh, uh, just one second, so we can see. We can see the question. Okay, well, we are, uh, um, okay, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have two questions. Um, uh, Kehama, do you suggest to average the funding of all schools? or to raise the fund of low financial schools without cutting down the well-funded one? Can you say that question one more time, please? Uh, uh, okay, do you, uh, mm, uh, a question about uh, specifically, um, do you suggest to average the funding of all schools or to raise the funding of low financial schools without cutting down the well-funded ones? I mean, I think it's important that our schools be funded equally. Um, and so I would not want to lower anything. I wouldn't want to lower any standards. I would like to raise for all. And I think that's the better solution. Um, and so I think what that means is when you look at state budgets, for example, um, or you know the way that, that systems are created about like how are we going to there should be, there should be a, if we're gonna have any kind of um, differences, there should be a really high floor, right? So for example, um, what I find, you know, now that my kid's in school is we have, I'm in, I'm in a school district that is, is well-funded, right? Relative to everywhere else in the country. Where there is some difference that is really obvious is in the PTA's funding. So when the PTA has these goals about, you know, we want to do the following things at my school, that gets done real quick because the people who live in my area have higher incomes. Meanwhile, the PTAs down the road are funding hard throughout the year just to get, you know, a little bit less, right? So I think that it's about raising, um, raising the bar all across. And that may mean that the states allocate differently um, than they have been in the past and they start spending more money on public schools. Like I, I just think overall, that's a good idea for all kinds of reasons. Um, I don't think for the most part that, that it's taken as seriously as it should be public education. So no, I wouldn't want to be um, 
it's not about diverting from those who have more. It's about raising for those who have had less. Uh, we have one. Uh, we have uh, uh, more questions, but uh, I think we'll take only one due to the uh, time limits. And I think this is actually this question actually really um, uh, related to uh, the concerns of a lot of people. So, how would you recommend addressing parents? who are concerned that their property tax dollars are being diverted away from their children. I think this gets back to the thing that I said previously about, it's, it really frustrates me personally mm -hmm. that, um, that there's, this kind of, there's this kind of anxiety around where we send our kids to school because we see that, oh, that's the good school and that's the bad school. And so people buy homes in the good school area if they can, right? Which actually can increase overcrowding. And I, this is something I know personally. Um, why not make all the schools good, right? So it's about this framing about we're taking something away from your children, why not? give more to all the children, period. Because actually it's not, the children have nothing to do with this. There's the whole argument about meritocracy and who works harder to give. The kids had no say in this. And that's what makes me angry. If you hear the tone of anger, right? It's, it's an injustice to me that there are kids who wake up in neighborhoods who have less, that have nothing to do with whether or not they want it, right? Whether or not that they're hungry for these things. And so in fact, they do not have the equal opportunities to explore these various subject matters or to explore all the things that they're capable of. Um, so what do I say about addressing parents? I think it's about reframing the issues. And I think it's about really kind of putting our values into our budgets. And so if we care about giving all children equal opportunities then our budgets need to reflect that much. Okay, thank you so much for your answers and thank you so much for a uh, really illuminating presentation. I think all of us have, um, have uh, <laughs> will we'll have a lot of additional thoughts and discussions about this. So let us thank our speaker. Thank you very much. And uh, we will move on with our with uh, our session. Our next uh, presentation is a science highlight given by Dr. Tom Immel, who is uh, mm, PI of the ICANN mission and uh, uh, senior fellow at UC Berkeley. And this uh, this presentation, this specific highlight, is given for advances in understanding how. Uh, low atmospheric winds and winds drive uh, um, uh, electrodynamics in the ionosphere. Thank you, Larissa, and thank you for the conveners for inviting this talk, and thanks for having that last talk. It was interesting for me to see the California districts that we've had students come from for our REU program, which is an NSF-funded activity, so we're very happy to be Who's that? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, louder. So this is a, a summary of a paper that was presented and um, published in Nature Geoscience. It came out uh, in 2021. The authors here are listed, and you should tug on their sleeve if you want a copy of the paper. The paper is posted in the NIH uh, archive as well, so you can have a, a uh, so even though we didn't, you know, it's not, it's a, nature's not open access, but the archived version of the nature paper is available on our website at Berkeley. If you search for ICON and Berkeley in the same uh, search, you'll get to the paper if you want it. Okay, so here we are. So one of ICON's uh, goals was to understand the daily variability in the ionospheric uh, densities that we observe in the daytime from one day to the next. And so we built the mission up and it flies in along an orbit like this with remote sensing instruments and an in situ instrument. The in situ instrument is, a, is built in Texas, is the IVM instrument um, that senses plasma velocities and densities. 
And the remote sensing instruments, which I'll be using today, are the MITEI instruments built in uh, DC, which are, uh, which with two views forward and aft give you a, um, uh, allow us to retrieve vector winds from the limb, limb observations. And every once in a while, those observations come together where you're observing winds on the same field line where you're observing the plasma. And so you can address the electrodynamics of that uh, uh, processes in the daytime ionosphere that, where the plasma is generated. Let's see, so neutral winds, plasma velocity distribution, and where we're gonna be focusing on things uh, near noon where things are a little simpler to analyze, and I'll show you why in a moment. And again, just if you haven't heard much about ICON uh, over the years, um, it does image these emissions that you can see with your own eyes or from the space station. This is from a Nikon camera on the space station that uh, retrieves the red line images, which we've already seen some red line this morning from uh, Larry, and also green line. At nighttime, the green line is a compact, narrow layer, but in the daytime, the green line is suffused through the E region so we retrieve green line winds from the E region, red line winds from the F region, put it all together and un to understand the electrodynamics of the region. I'm going to try it. Okay, so this is a visualization that we put together with actual data showing what you might expect. Um, vertical velocity um, from the ICON observations. This is the plasma velocity. At the same time, we're measuring winds off on the limb. As we cross near the magnetic equator, the, the, these uh, field lines are highlighted where the, there's a close match between the uh, remote observation and the in situ observations. And if you watched it, uh, if you maybe we'll play it one more time, um, you can see the winds reverse from a westward uh, um, velocity here, it's just shown down here at 117 kilometers, to an eastward velocity and when the, as the Winds do reverse from westward to eastward. You see the upward velocity of the plasma, where at the equator it sort of reverses, and during the rest of the pass, the velocity is downward. I'll just let it play. And thanks to the NASA Visualization Group at uh, Goddard for helping us put these data together. So there you have it. So there's a clue there that something's going on. When the re winds reverse, so does the so do the plasma velocities. We get this view um, you know, twice per orbit. We cross the magnetic equator. Half the time it's at night. Um, but when we're crossing at noon, and we, can, we get uh, noon crossings every, um, every month. So we can make these comparisons. All right, so I guess what, a, I don't know if this confession. We built the mission to do this, to address this problem. And then we got on orbit and we, saw that it was working, and then we sat down to try to figure out how to actually solve the problem. So, to, so we, I should say that it was Brian Harding who started this effort, and basically a year-long effort of a lot of Zoom calls during the pandemic to understand how to best frame the problem and address the question, which is, how would you predict the plasma velocities at the equator from wind observations? And um, uh, Brian, along with all of our co-authors that you saw, spent quite a bit of time on this problem. And the answer we came up with is if you're working at noon um, and in this coordinate system where maybe, um, let's say, uh, counter to your intuition, the, in this coordinate system, the velocity uh, V2 is in the meridional plane, is positive downward because um, well, because the, uh, in the magnetic coordinate system we're working at, the cross product of V1 and V2 is, you want that to be along the positive direction of the B field. So V2 is downward, um, uh, possibly counterintuitive. But V1 velocities in the, the, the one sense is um, the zonal sense. So this is the little cheat sheet for you. When I say one is zonal, two is meridional. Uh, second, of course, we're dealing with conductivities in the ionosphere. There's Hall and Pedersen conductivity, and we short, you know, we shorten this to Hall and Pedersen. So, 
what have you done here? So there's four terms in this equation, and I will talk through it some, and there's also more detail in the Nature paper that's online. But the, the key, key point is here is that these are capitalized winds, capitalized zonal wind, capitalized um, uh, meridional wind, and they're capitalized because they're height integrated, um, where we're integrating, convolving the, the um, or they're weighted by the conductivity. So the wind weighted, con so this is, a, so the cheat sheet here is, this is a, a U1H is the zonal, is the zonal wind um, weighted by the Hall conductivity. So it's a height integrated uh, f um, quantity, as are the conductances. So I think pe people understand, you, get, you start with a conductivity, a small sigma, you integrate along the field line, you have a height integrated quantity. So these are height integrated Hall Pedersen and Cowling conductivities. In any case, um, we put this together. We just thought we had uh, the answer, and so uh, let's, we worked on it, um, collecting the observations, working the data product for the winds up to version four, the uh, drift products for the plasma up to version five. Putting this together, we found that um, each of the terms could be calculated. And the observations, uh, this is just a quick plot, I have some more of these, but the observations from the plasma um, me measurements around the planet um, during a, a week where we had noon crossings um, could be compared to the winds that were measured at the same time, and we found a fairly good correspondence between the black line here and the gray line, and we found that good correspondence uh, quite often. This is a little bit more detail on the on the calculation. Just to, you know, we actually did start from first principles, Ohm's law, and the um, and continuity equation, with some specific assumptions. Um, if you integrate the con the um, the um, continuity equation, you get J1, J2, and J3. This current along the um, field line is in J3, but that integrated to the boundary conditions where the, the Earth is an insulator, these are going to integrate to zero. Um, and then the, a few more, there's four assumptions actually, I, I thought that we had three, but I counted four last night. There is no net current flow in the meridional direction, that's another sense too, that, that is the current is not emanating out from the Earth or precipitating in from the magnetosphere at the equator. And the zonal conductivity gradients are small, if you don't do this you end up with eight terms. Um, but with the zonal conductivities uh, being small near noon, then um, you can drop several, you, that's a, a simplifying assumption to allow you to proceed. Um, and so this is where we got down to. The last assumption is there, there's a constant, an external constant, which would enforce some constantly upward or downward drift of the plasma. Uh, the assumption is that that constant is co constant over a week of time. Solar minimum, that's probably very, quite true. Um, solar max, are things changing now that may be changing quite rapidly. Let's see what happens here. Oh, here we are. So, um, right, so this is just uh, three noon crossings where the correlation uh, numbers are shown. If you can't see them in the back, these are about 0.5. Um, this is the predicted wind, and this is the measured, sorry, the predicted plasma drift at the equator, and this is the measured plasma drift at the equator. And um, again, this is V2, so upward drifts are negative, and we're almost always seeing upward drift at noon, and we're always uh, getting a fairly good correspondence between the predicted wind and the measured wind. So what you might have asked yourself was, well, that's great, but you're just looking north all the time. You're missing half the problem, and that's true in some sense. The meridional winds um, are, well, some of those terms will integrate out if you can integrate the other hemisphere as well. Say if a meridional wind is flowing through your field right now, we're actually getting a contribution from the meridional winds in the prediction, which could be canceled out if you looked south and could measure those winds as well. And we only had money and space and time to build two uh, instruments for uh, the wind measurement, but we did spend some more time on the uh, observatory such that we could, sp and we, these are marked in the data when we have 250 of these conjugate observations where we rotate the spacecraft over the pr 
equatorial crossing that gives us um, views to the north and the south um, with the appropriate wind products at, at north and south to retrieve um, wind profiles that are magnetically conjugate to the, um, to that, to the um, apex of the field line at the equator. So this is something we're working on. We've been working to get the data wind product to version 5 before we start working on this paper. But these data are available right now if you want to get started on them. Um, we do have a lot of good coverage of the uh, winds to both the north and the south of the observatory. I think I probably need to keep moving. But so far, looking at those data, the, the, uh, we, you always do better if you include the north and the south. Um, than just the north in the calculation of the vertical drifts. Um, and there's some disparity between whether or not you just include the, the southern observations. Um, and we haven't figured that out yet. So a lot of work to go here still. Um, but we're very excited to um, be able to present this here and invite you to uh, look at the longer detailed de derivation. In, it's a one-pager uh, in the Nature paper that you can uh, pull down. And I think that we have one of the, oh, can I go back? Yes, just briefly go back to, what's, what's remarkable, I think, to all of us is that the Hall term, so the, the zonal winds are sort of provide some of the major drivers. And the, but the zonal wind weighted by the Pedersen conductivity and the Hall conductivity have opposite signs in driving the vertical drift. So that points to the importance of the shears that we're observing now at ICON and the phase of those winds as a function of altitude. Because if the Hall and Pedersen regions, I mean, it's an additional source of variability. Not only is the tide strong or weak, but what is the phase of the tide when it's hitting you at noon? Because the, the Pedersen and Hall regions are pretty, are not too far apart, but there can be strong shears between them. So it's, this cartoon or this plot shows uh, from IRI where the peak in the Pedersen, the peak of the peak in the Hall, the peak and the Pedersen conductivities are in altitude. And so um, the phase of the tide or any other shears that are appearing there is going to be important to this, uh, adding to the variability and uh, addressing the, the question of day-to-day -day variations in the uh, daytime ionosphere. With that, I better stop. Thank you, Larissa, and thank you for your attention. Tom, I, I was told not to stand there because uh, people see, apparently people see only my top of my head. <laughs> um, we have uh, questions for you. You you see them here, please. Oh. Uh. oh, I see. Yes, come back. I have to come back and talk to these people online. Hello, people online. I was told to come to this conference. That they were we're not going to take a remote presentation. I'm really glad I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know offhand what software the GSFC visualization team? No, um, but you should email me and I'll put you in Tom. I mean, it's Tom Bridgman who uh, was leading this effort and spent a lot of time on calls uh, with us and uh, the outreach team at Goddard and, and Bri me and Brian um, talking through all the different you know, ways to visualize these data. I don't know what he uses, but he could tell you. He'd be glad to share. Um, where are version 4 wind data available, public FTP sites? So we've held off publishing any more data. We have to publish everything within six months of collecting it and processing it. So that's the rule um, for the mission. Um, there's the data. The questions are sliding up. Um, so we expect version 5. Version 5 software is in the Science Data Center now, and it's in test. And um, but our science data center lead is in the hospital with COVID. So what can I tell you? It's, it's been a process to get to version 5. We've stopped processes in version 4. We could turn it back on again, but we really want to have version 5 uh, running. Um, so that I expect by the end of the summer, we have to have version 5 available for the, uh, for, for the world. Version 4 is processed out to March of this year. So uh, our full prime mission is published and available on the FTP site. How would the presence of vertical winds affect these calculations? I think it's, um, I would say, tell me when to stop. Minimal uh, effect of vertical winds. Um, so the meridional wind is, is vertical at the equator, 
but the, the, the meridional, com so the, when we take, so, so there's a, a meridional wind in all these, in the calculations. It's, the meridional wind is at, at, is vertical at the equator exactly, but everywhere else it's having a much larger contribution. So I think vertical winds are gonna be minimal compared to the, what's in the meridional winds, which are in effect vertical um, or in that sense, but I think that's a small contribution and we don't miss the vert anything from not having vertical winds. It attempts to use MHD or multi-fluid MHD to look at the dynamo effects. Oh yeah, how about you guys? Yes, sorry, we're gonna skip the MHD question. Okay, uh, so uh, Tom, when, when you showed the, the uh, scatter plot between the predicted and the measured uh, uh, data, so um, if I saw that correctly, there was some kind of a bias, is that correct? It looked like a little bit like an offset, so can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, so a bias, so not a zero crossing, so yeah. that they don't meet at zero. Um, I don't, if I think it's not going back, can we get the slides again one last time? I'm sorry, I'll try to be quick. Oh, right. Yes, this one. Oh, I see. I have to get back to you on that. Brian, do you want to comment on the bias? That's the external term, yes. That's what we're going to attribute this, the external. So can't you, just, can't you just normalize it out? Okay. Yeah, we just. Okay. Okay, I think we have, um, we'll take maybe one more question. Uh, uh, sorry, Bob, uh, in the work was, yeah. Yeah, in the work, please, maybe you can. Uh, Tom, uh, sorry. Whoa, that's big. Do, do you see a strong um, longitudinal dependence on the wind? Right. I think this plot doesn't show it very well, uh, or it didn't show up on the screen very well. But only, only any other plot. Did you see any strong dependence? Yes, there's a strong longitudinal dependence. If we didn't have this longitudinal, strong longitudinal variation, we wouldn't have a lot of signal to be basing upon the, 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 the you wouldn't have anything to fit. You just have a cloud of data around zero or something. So the tidal forcing, which has a four peak pattern around the planet as expected during this time of the year, it'd be stronger later in the year, but it's starting to show up here in spring. Um, that four peak pattern is what's giving us the signal and you can see it in these plots and in the paper better if you grab the paper. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, just one, uh, uh, one more. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, hi, Tom. I just wanted to say that I think the ICON data has just done a great job of, of uh, addressing the whole question of the dynamo and it's something that everyone thought was easy and it's actually quite uh, complex and we really congratulate the ICON team on this. My comment is that I do have, we did launch two rockets in conjunction with ICON, I'm gonna be showing them later this morning, and we're just baffled in trying to understand them. And Scott England's not here, but we really hope those on the ICON team who's working on this problem will, will help us with the rocket data. Thank you. That's right, Rob, thank you. Yeah, we, we had some rocket flights which were coordinated with ICON overpasses two, uh, two, uh, a week apart. Yeah, so we'll hear more later. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. We congratulate again, Tom and by Icon team. And uh, this concludes our uh, morning plenary session. Uh, uh, sorry for depriving you of a well-deserved break, but I think by this time uh, your coffee kicked in and you can go and ask more questions of the speakers. So we can, uh, you can get all your questions answered. And we are, we are back for individual sessions at 10 o'clock.